So let's start the uh, uh, today's lecture. Today's lecture is advanced acoustic modeling. Um, so today's lecture is uh, composed of two items. Uh, first one is context dependent hidden Markov model, and second one is adaptation. And then if we have extra time, I will also uh, go to the uh, language modeling section, which is uh, planned to be explained in, in the next time. But uh, I just want to save more time uh, in the next other uh, time for several explanations about the coding assignment and so on. So hope I can try to also start the language modeling uh, in the today's lecture. Okay, so today's lecture, uh, context-dependent hidden Markov model adaptation, is in the acoustic modeling part. And let me first recap uh, what we have done uh, previous lectures. We actually are the, the, uh, dealing with the hidden Markov model, right? And the hidden Markov model is introduced to represent the, a phoneme representation. And even phoneme can be represented with uh, the further decomposition uh, based on the state. Uh, like uh, uh, in this uh, example, uh, phoneme one, two, is uh, the composite uh, HM state one of the silence uh, beginning, uh, second one, third one, and the same for the other phoneme like a T and so on. So this is the, our most uh, precise unit uh, introduced in our courses. However, this uh, unit is still not enough to capture the variation of the phoneme. The most famous uh, the, the phoneme uh, variation is a context-dependent phoneme, context-dependent hidden Markov model. First, I put the two words, a car and a key. Can you just try to pronounce it both? A car and a key. And the, please focus on K, the consonant K. A car, it comes uh, the, by, uh, the, from the, the first phoneme, which is usually open the mouth. And the, a key, uh, sorry, the, 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 a car is uh, usually having the phoneme, uh, the uh, uh, K, uh, the phoneme, it's uh, the, the first, pronunciated, and then the AR is uh, the, the following. And this AR is uh, the, the based on R, and the which is the, the, uh, sounded by uh, making the mouth open. A key uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the followed by the vowel E, uh, which is actually close uh, compared with R. And then in this case, K is actually slightly changed acoustically, a car and a key. If you also pronounce it these two K, you could actually see where you, uh, the, the, how to say, make a resonance of the phoneme K, which is actually slightly different depending on the context. So actually many of the phone, phonemes changing slightly this acoustic property depending on the context. So to uh, the consider this uh, the context dependency, we actually often further expand our phoneme unit, unit to consider the context. For example, depending on the previous phoneme and the following phoneme, we actually using the different phoneme category. In this case, K uh, following A and the K following I would be considered as a different category. This sounds very cool in terms of making our phoneme to be very uh, precise, right? However, if we really consider this uh, the, the variation 
it's actually quite makes our category a large. Uh, for example, let's say we have a 40 phonemes. And then the, the, these 40 phonemes, depending on the previous phoneme, previous 40 phonemes, and depending on the previous, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, following 40 phonemes. So, and also we have a three state uh, per uh, the phoneme. Then the total number of HMM state would be 200,000. So we try to kind of uh, capture the, uh, the phoneme variation with the 200,000 categories. And uh, what do you think it, uh, about this number of the categories. It is too big, right? Um, 40 manageable, 120 manageable, but uh, the, uh, the 200,000 is too much. And actually this is not only just the number of phonemes units are too large. There would be a lot of unseen phonemes in the data. So it is very difficult to cover uh, the variation of the old phonemes uh, in the corpus. So instead of uh, the, the using 200,000 of the state, we actually using the clustering and then using the phoneme, that is a kind of set of the, uh, the, uh, the several, uh, the, this uh, the, the state as a one unit, instead of considering all context dependent hidden Markov model as a single category so that we avoid to have a 200,000 other units to be like around 1,000 or 10,000 and so on. And then how to make uh, this uh, clustering is the next, the next question. And then the, what we will do is actually uh, the, using the clustering technique. This clustering technique is called phonetic, phonetic decision tree clustering. And to uh, make this kind of a clustering, we actually using a top-down manner. First, all the root node corresponding to the uh, phoneme, which consider all context. So this means that we don't consider the context, right? This uh, the root node is actually context independent form. And then let's try to make a context dependent form. But as I said, instead of consider all possible phoneme states, we just try to cluster this phoneme based on some rule. The one rule uh, often we use is a phonetic question. For example, in this question cases, the following phoneme is boil or not. By asking this question, we can cluster two sets of the, uh, uh, the phoneme from the original uh, the single uh, the, the context dependent phonemes. Like in these cases, uh, this is only applied for the, uh, the uh, following phoneme. So previous phoneme uh, didn't change it. But in these cases, only the phoneme that have boil in the, uh, the following, that is clustered as a one uh, the unit. And the other is the rest. And this uh, the, the question is applied to uh, the, uh, the many of the, uh, the, this uh, the, the node and try to find the best cluster. That is the first question. So for example, the other question possibly would be this phoneme is nasal or not. The preceding phoneme is nasal or not then we can have a different split uh, compared with the previous split, right? And uh, basically we make this kind of a question. So this question can be boil or not, uh, cross boil or not, front boil or not, nasal or not, silence or non-silence or not, or even individual uh, the, the phoneme as a question, uh, is it A or is it E or something like that? So all these questions are made first as a phonetic questions. And then apply to each node, 
and then selecting the best split based on some criteria. I will explain what kind of criteria we will use. But by doing that, we can find the best cluster, uh, best uh, the split uh, in terms of some kind of criteria uh, for each node, right? This is just starting from the root node, uh, the context independent form, to just splitting the two one. And we using the, uh, the, the question several times to find the best split. This is only just one split, but this split can be recursively done for each, for each node, right? We first do some other uh, the, the question and then find the best question and then split this kind of a two node. And this is not the end of the clustering because this is only uh, the splitting the, uh, the all phonemes to two uh, context independent phonemes. So we apply this question uh, the, again here to split uh, the, the further uh, the, the, uh, the node. And this kind of split process is recursively performed. And finally, uh, we make a tree. And then after we make a tree, regarding, for example, this unit as our uh, the, 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 the unit, this cluster, this leaf node as our unit, and so on. By doing that, uh, we avoid to have uh, 200,000 states. But in this case, it's, for example, one, two, three, four. It can be more, actually. But uh, basically, uh, the, by using that, we can actually uh, cluster the uh, HMM state uh, efficiently uh, based on this phonetic uh, the, the question. OK, so uh, this is the, uh, the, the clustering algorithm it, itself. But of course, clustering requires some criteria, right? I said that the score. And what score uh, we will use? There are a lot of, by the way, variety. Like the most, uh, the, the most discriminative method will be to use the ASR performance, right? Every time we split, we compute the speech recognition performance. And then uh, the get the best, uh, the, uh, the split and so on. But it is very expensive. So people usually don't do it. Second approach is that we should always care about the number of the other uh, uh, data assigned to this other uh, cluster, right? As I mentioned, uh, this other uh, cluster will be the unit to avoid uh, the overtraining. So if we have a more data, more kind of uh, the uh, unit, this means that the more data will be assigned to this other uh, unit. So in this, for example, cases, uh, if we have a more uh, the, the unit, this means that, that we will avoid to have our, uh, the, the overtraining. But to uh, the directly measure this kind of uh, the overtraining issue, probably number of counts would also be the one possibility. And this is actually used uh, in many cases. Uh, number of the data, number of frames assigned to this cluster. However, uh, this one doesn't care so much about the acoustic uh, the feature information. So to uh, the fully uh, represent the Gaussian, uh, to fully represent the acoustic feature, people actually using the Gaussian uh, to represent uh, this other uh, cluster, like we represent uh, the, the hidden Markov model itself as a Gaussian. Okay. However, here I just want to mention that we use a single Gaussian, not using the Gaussian mixture model. The reason is that the Gaussian mixture model is actually making the uh, the uh, the EM algorithm. Uh, uh, with the EM algorithm, uh, that we can also compute the likelihood of the Gaussian mixture model. However, this process, as you can see, that we perform the question here, 
split the uh, the uh, node and then compute the likelihood. We do that for all the question and selecting the best question and moving to the next node and so on. This actually computation is quite heavy. So every time computing the EM algorithm is quite difficult. So instead we actually using the single Gaussian and we even using the fixed alignment, not uh, the moving the HMM state. So uh, the, the, in this case, is we actually just make uh, some initial model and then performing the, uh, the, the Bitabi alignment and the fixed alignment and then compute the Gaussian. So by using that, uh, the, if we fix the alignment, uh, we can actually avoid to have the uh, EM iterative computation and we can compute the likelihood at the one shot uh, based on uh, the, uh, for these uh, the, all of the variation. So this is the trick uh, of uh, making this clustering to be uh, tractable uh, based on the small computation. So I will explain a bit more about uh, these uh, the algorithms, but it's a little bit uh, high, uh, the, the, uh, it's a little bit uh, advanced topic. So uh, the, in addition to this lecture, uh, please also check the reference that I put in this slide. Anyway, I will try to explain about the algorithm. So first, uh, to compute this uh, the uh, single Gaussian likelihood, we perform the beta B algorithm for all the data and get the HMM state sequence. By the way, you guys may think why uh, the, 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 we are using the beta B algorithm, which means that we already have a model, right? Yes, we are assuming that we have a model. So for this kind of HMM based approaches, we always assuming we have some initial model and then getting the beta B alignment and then doing this processing and so on. And after we get the each unit, we actually performing the HMM, GMM, bar marriage algorithm again. So this uh, the process is actually uh, the work, uh, the having the, uh, the bar marriage algorithm in everywhere. And once we compute the alignment of all the kind of uh, the data and the corresponding uh, the HMM state, we could actually compute the Gaussian statistics, uh, the sufficient statistics that I mentioned before. And then based on this uh, the, the, uh, the Gaussian statistics, we can actually compute the likelihood. I will omit the, all the kind of derivation, but please uh, check this uh, the final equation. Uh, this is the likelihood of each node. This likelihood is computed by the all the count number of the frames assigned to this node. And then uh, the final part, uh, this D is the dimension. So only that we care about this part. And this is actually variance parameter. And this variance is not for the, uh, the single HMM state, but we consider the all clustering, uh, all the kind of uh, uh, the HMM state in a cluster, and then compute the variance. And this actually can be uh, efficiently performed uh, if we already know the Gaussian statistics. So this actually computation uh, does not require the iterative process. And then uh, we compute this uh, the variance and then making this as a likelihood value. So this is, I will say one shot. We don't need an EM algorithm. Uh, we don't need a, 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 the, the forward backward or beta B algorithm and so on. We need a beta B algorithm once, but that's uh, the, the one time is fine. And then uh, the, we, when we get the uh, likelihood of this, uh, the, the each node, this one, we actually compute the like log likelihood difference. This is also uh, the, uh, computed by uh, this uh, the, the equation. 
which is actually the uh, likelihood term uh, of the, uh, the yes split, no split, minus previous uh, the, the unsplitted node. So this first term is corresponding to the likelihood of this one. Okay. And the, this uh, the likelihood corresponding to the likelihood here. And then the last third term of the likelihood corresponding to the unsplitted node. Okay. So that if we change, for example, questions, at least this value can be changed based on this equation. And then by using this uh, the like log likelihood as a criterion, we can actually find the maximum split uh, the, from uh, the all possible other uh, question uh, in the node. So the, again, the answer is we just using the likelihood, single Gaussian based, and then we can actually compute it efficiently. Um, any other que any questions about this further? Yes. Sorry, what's the I substitute again? I is the HMM state, one of the HMM state before clustering. Okay. Included in the order kind of uh, the node omega. Okay. Any other questions? I will say that this part is a little bit complicated. Um, and this part is a little bit advanced. And this part is a little bit too advanced to be listed in the midterm exam. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you one hint. Yeah, this this part is very important, and I would like you to understand this one. But first, understand the concept, and then check the reference paper and so on. Yeah. Yes. All right. Maybe maybe some question. The uh, data, the number of the count. Yeah. So uh, that the uh, in the uh, the included in each node. Number of the frame. Okay. Uh, any other high level question about this one? Can people understand? Anyway, we have our have to consider the context in the HML stand states, but it is too many. So we have to cluster it. And then we want to use, usually using the Gaussian statistics to find the best permutation, best uh, this, uh, the split uh, the, of the uh, HML state. And this unit is the, uh, the standard unit used for the real uh, HMM-based system. So this is actually very complicated, but it is quite widely used. Okay, then the, uh, the um, I just explained that the uh, we use a maximum likelihood criteria to select the uh, appropriate question for each for each node, right? By applying this kind of a, a maximum likelihood criteria, we can get the optimum split for each of the nodes, right? 
However, I didn't actually explain about the important things. For the clustering, the other important part is how to set the number of cluster, right? And uh, let me check whether what is my question for this sort of quiz. Okay, um, maybe I can ask the question now. Uh, can you uh, the, the make the uh, question to be enabled? <laughs> The question is about, uh, we can only use a maximum likelihood criteria, criterion to make a uh, decision tree. Yes. Are you asking if it's dependent? Yes. One more minute. Yes. How do you ensure that every case is not completely dependent? How do you ensure that you don't have one just of one state to be in? Very good question. Um, actually, um, this is a part of the answer of this question. <laughs> Okay, I'll finish the uh, poll. So what you have asking was exactly very good question. If, for example, we apply the question, quantity question to every time for each node, and then maximum likelihood always increase the likelihood value, right? And then their answer is try to split all the kind of nodes as many as possible. And it can be even 200,000 that I mentioned. So sometimes questions also including the individual, individual pointing, like this other pointing is A or not, and so on. So as long as we have such kind of question, uh, all the kind of nodes can be split. And each node actually corresponding to the uh, each of the HMM uh, the, the, the uh, state without clustering. So this doesn't have any meaning, right? Our uh, the, the intention is to control the, uh, the, the sufficient numbers of clusters. So maximum likelihood is not the best criteria. Uh, for this other uh, purpose. It is good for uh, the selecting the best question for each node, but it doesn't uh, be used as an entire clustering measure. And then actually some people are using the several other uh, model selection criteria 
like a minimum description length or Bayesian information criteria uh, or a variation of Bayesian so on. Uh, by the way, uh, the, my first uh, the paper, my first research in speech is using the variation of Bayes uh, for this phonetic decision clustering. And then try to find the optimal structure uh, in terms of the Bayesian criteria. And this is actually uh, the advanced topics again. And the people are using, uh, developing uh, various techniques to find the other, uh, what is the kind of best uh, stop criteria for this uh, the, the clustering problem. And the other method is a little bit heuristic, but let's say, you know, that just setting it as a 5,000 or 10,000. Uh, making a more like a, this one with the ad hoc other heuristic parameters to decide the uh, size. And uh, some other people also using the threshold, setting the threshold of this kind of uh, the, uh, log likelihood difference. If this log likelihood difference becomes smaller than some threshold, we also split the, uh, the, uh, the node and so on. So there are a lot of ways to control uh, this uh, the number of clusters. And the currently, many people actually just using the set of uh, maximum leaf node. But the, again, a uh, lot of systems are using different ways. So uh, let's uh, the, the review this entire algorithm. I mentioned a uh, uh, couple of times before, but I just uh, uh, summarize it. First, uh, the, uh, make a context independent hidden Markov model. So the, in the beginning, we performing the HMM, GMM, but using the context independent one. Why we need this one? With this kind of uh, initial model, we can perform the beta B algorithm to get the alignment of the old data in terms of the HMM. And then fix this uh, the, the alignment and then computing the statistics and so on. Given the alignment, we know that uh, the how many HMM, uh, how many frames are assigned to the HMM state, right? The, the answer about the question, what is T? is again the number of frames assigned in this beta B step. After the beta B step, we know that all the data belongs to each HMM state. So we can compute the number of frames for each HMM state. And even other values like a mean and variance and so on. And then other performing the three, uh, this uh, the, the, the forensic decision tree clustering to uh, get the, uh, the, the uh, context dependent uh, the unit. And, and then we performing the HMM, uh, GMM again, training again. So we at least need to have a uh, two EM algorithm, two other Bumwell algorithm uh, to uh, get the final uh, the, the HMM, GMM state if uh, using the context dependent acoustic models. And this part uh, that is again now replaced with a, a deep neural network, especially this GMM part, uh, this GMM part is replaced with a deep neural network. But still the, uh, the, the HMM based deep neural network is following this kind of uh, the approaches. So uh, the, uh, please uh, the also uh, the understand that uh, this kind of a, a framework. And then the other, uh, what kind of a, uh, the, uh, the parameter, hyperparameter becomes important in the HMM state, uh, in the HMM GMM. As I mentioned previously in the HMM Gaussian mixture model, I said that the number of Gaussian are uh, important hyperparameters. But now we also have our, uh, the, the HMM states, number of context-dependent HMM states 
is also very important hyperparameter. So if usually uh, the, 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 the specify the, uh, the uh, uh, hidden Markov model GMM for speech recognition, we usually use these two hyperparameters, number of uh, the total HMM state and the number of uh, the, the, uh, the total Gaussian, and then specify the model. That is what we usually do uh, for the, uh, the specifying the HMM based speech recognition. And again, even we move this one to the uh, deep neural network systems, uh, this part will be replaced with a deep neural network, but this part is not replaced with a deep neural network. So this uh, the, the hyperparameter is still important for uh, the HMM uh, deep neural network uh, based speech recognition. Okay, so this is about the uh, the uh, the context dependent hidden Markov model. Yes. So we perform uh, the therapy in step two, so that we can get the initial alignment and the first likelihood. Right. Yes. Uh, don't you have to perform a therapy for each mode? We don't do it, which is very uh, the, the, uh, the expensive. So uh, the, uh, we don't do it. Instead, uh, the, we fix alignment, and then we using the single Gaussian, and then we don't have to do the EM algorithm anymore. So this is a very important uh, the, the step. Uh, the, we doing the, uh, the, the beta alignment, but during the, uh, the phonetic decision clustering, we don't do any uh, the, the, uh, beta variable so as you see beta variable is expensive right we have to check scan the each data but the after beta variable uh, and then we actually can get the statistics so i also explained about sufficient statistics uh, with this sufficient statistics we don't have to scan the data anymore but we can uh, the compute all the likelihood of the each node Yeah, very good question. And uh, this is again the important concept. By the way, this sounds very uh, the large approximation, right? But practically, practically, it is working. Okay, uh, let's uh, move to the next agenda. Uh, this is adaptation. And still, I am talking about the, the uh, uh, acoustic modeling part. And then are uh, talking about the adaptation. Maybe I can start from this one. So not only for speech recognition problems, in general, if we're using the data, always that data has bias, right? And then uh, if we have a new data, we have to adapt our model to that specific uh, environment. Uh, that uh, adaptation technique is very, very uh, popular uh, in many of the machine learning problems. And of course, are the essential in speech recognition. And in speech recognition, historically, uh, adaptation techniques was uh, the, the, the mostly investigated for speaker. So if, for example, uh, the, may, we make a speaker independent speech recognition systems by correcting many of your voices. That will be good in terms of the correcting many data and in terms of making the system to be robust to be a speaker, right? However, if we have some particular person's amount of the data that is available and then we could adapt the model uh, from this uh, the speaker independent model to the speaker dependent system, right? So this is a very well-known uh, adaptation. Uh, the techniques are used in the speech recognition. And the two, uh, the realize this uh, the speaker, speaker adaptation, uh, there are two types of the approach. One of the maximum posterior adaptation and the other is maximum linear uh, likelihood linear regression, MLLR uh, adaptation. By the way, the, 
can you guys come up with the other adaptation than speaker? Speech has a lot of variations, right? Accent. Yes, accent is very good. Yes. Any other variations that we could? Sentiment. Sentiment, yes. Anything else? Gender, yes. But it's a kind of similar to the speaker, right? You can also have device. Kind of. Device, yeah, getting similar to what I want to get. Uh, device is uh, they are, they are more like a um, recording uh, the, the environment, right? And the other important recording environment is by the way, noise, reverberation. This is very, very important for speech. So uh, the, the, these adaptation techniques can also be used for the noise reverberation condition, by the way, not only for the speaker. But uh, all the, uh, the, the, the what you guys mentioned, the uh, accent, uh, uh, the gender, uh, the sentiment, and so on, are very good points. Yeah, this is actually uh, the the uh, important for speech recognition to be adapted to such kind of environment. By the way, people may think about language would be another possibility, right? This is completely true. However, uh, in acoustic modeling adaptation. Uh, the, the, the theoretically language part is actually uh, performed in this lexical and the language modeling part. And the theoretically acoustic modeling is, can be a, a language independent given the speech features to predict in the form, right? Or phoneme. Phoneme case is a little bit language dependent, but if we try to predict the language, the form, IPA form, and so on. This is language independent, right? But uh, practically, actually, the uh, language uh, dependency exists in the acoustic model, and also uh, the language uh, the adaptation uh, is also used in the acoustic modeling part. But the people mostly focus on the noise and the um, noise and the, uh, the, the speaker uh, in the acoustic modeling context. Okay, uh, let's first talk about the maximum of posterior estimation. This is actually already appeared in our course. Uh, for example, to solving this uh, PW given O, we actually uh, the decompose it to the likelihood and the PW, this is a prior. And then uh, the using the, uh, the, uh, this uh, optimization, Instead, instead of this one, is uh, the most that people are called as uh, the maximum a uh, posteriori uh, parameter estimation. So uh, this is the uh, the case uh, the, that we uh, the predicting the speech uh, recognition transcript. But uh, let's move to uh, this discussion in the parameter estimation. So in the parameter estimation. We have discussed a lot for the maximum likelihood based estimation, right? Basically, uh, the, we uh, the try to solve the, uh, max, uh, the parameters based on this criteria. Although this is a little bit difficult in the HMM, GMM cases, so we using the EM algorithm and so on. But anyway, basically, a uh, maximum likelihood estimation is try to estimate the, uh, the, the parameter of this likelihood value. However, in the maximum of posterior estimation, it is actually uh, the regarding the likelihood value and uh, uh, the uh, prior uh, distribution, like similar to the, uh, the we uh, the consider the language model as a prior. And then the, the, we are uh, using this uh, the form, uh, the equation to solve uh, the uh, parameter estimation instead of only consider the likelihood. So the difference is whether prior distribution is included or not. So by the way, this is a, a, the, the, the one of the approximation of the Bayesian method. And the other uh, more strict Bayesian method usually also the marginalize these parameters. 
And this is, you know, mostly done by the variation of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, and so on. But again, uh, in this lecture, uh, these are uh, more advanced topics. So we more focus on the maximum likelihood, uh, sorry, maximum posteriori estimation by only considering prior information as an additional other function in the optimization process. Okay, so now that, uh, that we have uh, this kind of factors, and then let's uh, talk about what is the difference. So uh, say that uh, we try to kind of uh, uh, estimate the uh, the uh, real uh, likely uh, real uh, the parameters, Gaussian parameters, and so on. And the other, uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, the, this kind of a true distribution here. Okay. However, in some cases, we only get the bias sample here. Okay. This, this is just the bias sample. If we have more samples, probably we can get the, uh, this distribution, uh, this sample to be similar to this true distribution. But uh, due to the uh, issue in the, uh, the uh, uh, recording or whatever, we only have some uh, selected uh, portion of the point. And then what's happened when we do the maximum likelihood? We just try to uh, the, the, uh, estimate the, uh, the uh, parameter which just fit to this uh, data, right? However, if we know some prior distribution, for example, this data tend to go to the left side. In some cases, we know the prior distribution. Speech cases, it's more naturally, we can get the prior information because it's a physical uh, the problem. So we can actually find some prior constraint. But anyway, if we have this prior constraint and then this actual data, we could actually possibly recover this true distribution. Although the, uh, the difficulty is how to get the prior information, right? And then again, going back to the speak adaptation cases. So as I mentioned in the speak adaptation, we first build speech recognition system by correcting many speakers and then making a speaker independent system. Uh, why we correct many speakers? Because it is very difficult to correct enough amount of training data from single speaker, right? So instead we ask you guys to speak uh, five minutes and then we can easily get uh, you know, 250 minutes of the data. Right, instead of one person here to speak at uh, the four hours, it is very efficient way to collect the data, right? And then we have this kind of speaker independent system. Yes, this is a speaker independent system. So it's slightly different from the, uh, the, the, uh, the other uh, the target speaker, like my voice and the speaker independent system may is definitely different. However, it is not very different, right? All are come from the human voices. And actually some of the, the voices are the, the, of your uh, voice can be actually close to mine, right? So this speaker independent model can be a very good prior distribution uh, to uh, the, the get uh, the, my, uh, the, the uh, speaker dependent system. So this is a very reasonable assumption. So this actually approach is widely used uh, the, the for uh, the, the speaker uh, adaptation setup. By the way, we can do the same analogy to even accent or noise or sentiment or whatever. We first collect the many data as much as possible and then using it as a prior model and then adapting to the, uh, the other target uh, the attribute. Uh, that is uh, the, the, the methodology that the, the, the prior based approach is working. And then the, actually to uh, the solve uh, this uh, the, the, uh, map estimation, we can actually follow the exactly same process as the, uh, the HM parameter estimation. 
So this part, uh, uh, really we have uh, too many uh, the equation. So I mostly skipping it. And I also the, the, the adding the difference. So please check this one. And uh, again, I will try to explain uh, the, some high level concept uh, rather than explain the detail uh, for this uh, the explanation about it. Um, the, anyway, the, 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 the procedure is almost the same uh, using the uh, introducing latent variable, uh, making a complete data likelihood, making the auxiliary function, and the parameter estimation, and so on. And the uh, latent variable introduction is actually exactly the same. We're just using the HMM state and the uh, the, the Gaussian mixture. So we skip this one. And the complete data likelihood is changed uh, since we also try to consider this theta as an incomplete data. And then we making a joint probability of the observation state sequence, uh, the Gaussian mixture sequence and the parameter. So it becomes actually very complicated. But again, uh, please, you do not have to entirely follow this equation. I just want to mention that the, uh, the, we need to consider this theta to make our uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the complete data likelihood. After that, auxiliary function uh, is also uh, defined. However, this auxiliary function is actually uh, just formed as the original auxiliary function and the prior distribution. So we can actually compute this one uh, the efficiently uh, by using the same uh, uh, the forward backward algorithm, but has uh, just the, some modification of this other uh, data prior distribution part and the parameter uh, estimation. Uh, and so on. This is also almost same, except that we have some kind of additional prior distribution function. And the I, the the the, the most of the question I had for this kind of prior distribution is that what kind of distribution we should set. And then the uh, the like uh, the, the we have discussed in the previous uh, HMM uh, based uh, the, the distribution setup uh, prior distribution setup is also uh, the, uh, the uh, easily uh, the, the provided by following the rule. First, we should consider the domain of the parameters. Uh, for actually weight parameters relating the initial weight. Uh, the, the mixture weight and the, uh, the state transition. Uh, this is actually uh, the, the, uh, the, the has to satisfy the sum to one condition. And these are the, the uh, parameters are modeled by the Dirichlet di distribution. Okay, the next question, uh, the Gaussian parameters, uh, should we add a, a, which kind of distribution should we use to add a, represent the Gaussian mean parameters? Actually, it's already written here. The answer is the Gaussian, right? The reason is because Gaussian mean is not bounded. Same for the MSCC. Uh, features. So we should actually using the uh, the Gaussian uh, distribution. However, the issue is the variance parameters. This is bounded. So as a prior distribution, uh, we use the gamma uh, distribution. So these are kind of uh, the exercise that you guys should remember, uh, not uh, for this kind of, uh, only for this uh, the map estimation. In general, 
uh, that if we uh, try to provide in the actual distribution, you have to consider the domain of the parameters and then uh, the providing the appropriate uh, distribution. However, one uh, the, the constraint is that this should distribution must be an exponential family. Otherwise, we cannot get the cross form solution. So actually, we don't have so many options. Just the Gaussian, gamma, Wishart, uh, Dirichlet, uh, multinomial, uh, and so on are our kind of uh, the, the limited uh, the options. Okay, so by doing that, uh, we set the, uh, the prior distributions uh, based on the uh, Dirichlet distribution here, and the normal distribution, and the gamma distribution. Each of the kind of a prior distribution is uh, the, the, uh, becomes the uh, is uh, the representing the uh, domain of the each high, uh, parameter like a pi a, a w mu and the uh, r and these are uh, the the further parameterized by the other uh, the the uh, parameters and these parameters of the parameters are called the hyperparameters in the Bayesian context. And again, the, this part, I will mostly skip it uh, because it is very complicated. But uh, just, I want to show you the one of the solution. This is a solution of the mean parameter based on the map estimation. If you do not care about this one, let's use pen just removing this one. Um, only with this uh, solution, do you remember? Is this the, what is uh, the, the result of this estimation? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is exactly maximum likelihood estimation, right? And then actually the map estimation have an additional term here. And I will explain about this additional term here. By the way, this mu zero corresponding to the prior distribution. So this one is again the, the sum of the mean parameters estimated from the speaker independent models. And then this one is corresponding to the speaker adaptation data. Okay, uh, let's move to understand this kind of a solution. For example, if we don't have any data, what's happened? If we don't have any adaptation data, what's happened? This means that this, this uh, the, the, uh, data goes to zero, right? And then only we consider this term. And then this the, the denominator and the numerator is canceled. So if there is no data, it goes to the speaker independent model parameters. Very makes sense, right? If there is no data, we just using a speaker independent models. Okay, let's consider the opposite cases. If we have a too many adaptation data of my voice, what's happening? This data becomes too dominant and then this one, we can actually ignore it, right? And then this solution becomes maximum likelihood of my voice. So again, this one is collecting from all of you guys data and then making a speech recognition system, which is very valid if we don't have any amount of my voice, right? But if we have a, a too many, uh, the enough sufficient amount of my data, we should use the maximum likelihood estimation of my data, right? And then map estimation is actually the, uh, represented as a, uh, the interpolation of this point. And depending on the amount of data, the uh, estimation of the parameters goes from here to gradually goes to the maximum likelihood estimation. 
So very theoretically beautiful solution we can get. So this is actually the, uh, the well-known map adaptation uh, uh, the performance. This is the amount of the adaptation training data, again, my voice. And this is the accuracy uh, the, of speech recognition performance. So higher is better. Let's say maximum likelihood of performance. The beginning, we don't have a, my voice. So we cannot make a model, right? But gradually we have a data, we can make a speech recognition system of my voice uh, the, with enough amount of data. This is a more like uh, the, the, uh, the, the straightforward uh, the, the performance curve, I would say. And then map adaptation is actually starting from the speaker independent part. And then in the small amount of training data, map is actually getting a better performance, especially, you know, this kind of uh, the uh, irregular area. Uh, this is very true that based on this equation, we at least uh, the, the preserve that this system can provide a speaker independent model performance. So it not, does not go to zero. And then theoretically, if we have a large amount of data, maximum likelihood, to, uh, maximum a posteriori uh, the, uh, adaptation is equivalent to the maximum likelihood of performance. So that's the kind of map estimation and the map adaptation. And the, I will quickly explain about the other uh, estimation method and then we'll finish my lecture. The other uh, estimation approach, maximum likelihood linear regression is also widely used as an alternative to the map estimation. This approach is basically uh, try to uh, find the transformation of the Gaussian parameters. So as I mentioned that the Gaussian parameter is like a 10,000 or 100,000, depending on the system. It's so many. So that we require a significant amount of data to train the model. However, instead of training this model, let's try to find the, uh, the, the uh, transformation that is an MLLR adaptation. So for example, if we have this kind of uh, the, uh, various uh, the Gaussian model. And then maximum likelihood estimation is to find this kind of mean variance and so on for each parameters. But instead of finding this kind of each parameter, uh, this uh, MLLR is try to find the linear regression of all these Gaussian parameters. So if you check this kind of uh, the, the equations, you can see that J, K, again, corresponding to the HMM state and the, Ga uh, the Gaussian mixture. So total uh, number of Gaussians will be like a 10,000 and so on. However, instead of estimating this one, we only estimating this one. So this is just a linear matrix. So the number of parameters is very small. Even we have a millions of the Gaussians, this other parameter is like an order of the hundred or thousand, only the, the small number of parameters to find the transformation. So by doing that, uh, since number of the, uh, the parameters becomes very small, we can actually estimate this, uh, the, the, the parameters efficiently. And there are a lot of variants of this kind of approaches. For example, instead of estimating the, uh, the transformation of the, high, uh, the parameters, we can also consider the transformation of the, the speech feature itself. This is by the almost equivalent solution. But anyway, the important point is that this estimation or this estimation is solved by the EM algorithm. 
similar to the map adaptation. Uh, by using this other parametric form, we can estimate these other parameters based on the EM algorithm. And uh, I'm, it sounds like I'm uh, saying very trivial things, but the, the, you guys may also think, why not using the nonlinear function? Why not using a more complicated uh, transformation, but still at a small number of parameters? Can we do that? The answer is no. Uh, we cannot actually solve the equation. So this linear constraint is one of the only constraints that we can get to the EM uh, based solution. So uh, this approach and the map approach is very unique in the sense that we can get the EM algorithm based solution. And the other parametric approach basically cannot get the solution uh, based on the EM. So it is very inefficient. And uh, uh, I will uh, finally uh, explain about the, uh, the these three adaptation technique. So as I mentioned, the maximum likelihood and the map has this kind of behavior. And the MLR is actually located in this kind of uh, uh, the region. In the MLR estimation, the number of parameters is just a transformation parameters, very small. So it's working only with a very small amount of data. So it's actually uh, the getting the, uh, the, uh, the better performance in the beginning of the amount of training data. However, do you think this transformation is enough, accurate to uh, convert all the kind of Gaussian to be the, uh, the, the uh, desired form? The answer is no. This is only linear transformation, right? So compared with maximum likelihood or map estimation, this other uh, representation is very weak, too much constraint to get the accurate performance when we have the large amount of training data. So of course, there are a lot of techniques to uh, make the MLRL perform better in this region. But uh, by using the simple uh, MLRL, we actually have uh, this kind of uh, issue that the, uh, if the amount of training data is large, it doesn't reach to the uh, map or uh, maximum likelihood estimation. But again, uh, there are a lot of ways to solve these approaches. And one of them is actually, actually this paper solving the uh, problem of this region based on the regression tree. And the, let's uh, go to the uh, short, short quiz. Uh, second one. Maybe that this one with this graph, it is obvious, but uh, uh, please answer it. Thirty more seconds. Okay, please close the poll. So the answer is uh, MLR, right? Since the number of parameters are very small, so it's actually quickly adapt uh, to the uh, target, uh, the, the, the speaker performance and so on. 
Okay, so I wanted to move to the language modeling, but it's almost uh, the, the uh, time to finish. So I would like to uh, accept questions. Any questions? 